Medicare spending is among the top drivers of the nation's expanding debt. Everyone knows it. It's not up to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to set policy, though. It's up to Congress. For some details, Federal Drive host Tom Temin turned to a senior fellow at the conservative American Enterprise Institute, James Capretta. Let's talk about the structure of the Medicare system. I mean, I think people typically assume it's a pay-as-you-go system, and it might be that. But like Social Security, there is a couple of trust funds. How do they operate, and how do they affect the spending in ways that might be a little bit subtle? There is one trust fund that is kind of like Social Security, the Hospital Insurance Trust Fund. That was the original idea for Medicare. It was added on to Social Security so that people paid payroll taxes during their working lives and then got this hospitalization protection when they retired at 65. Then they added a second part at the time of enactment of Medicare called Part B, the SMI trust fund. And this trust fund is not pay-as-you-go like a payroll tax trust fund. It's a premium. So people pay premiums, and then the government contributes the other 75%. So it's basically a 25-75 split with the beneficiaries paying a premium and the government paying for the rest. It's pay-as-you-go in a certain way, but not in the same way people understand it with the Social Security payroll tax. And that's a big – now 60% of the program, Medicare spending, is in Part B, not the hospital side, which is Part A. So is the answer to simply raise the premiums or cut the benefits? I mean, the formulas are what they are, just like the tax code. They're enshrined in law. And therefore, what are the trends showing us about that secondary fund? Well, I think the the big issue here is that we're going through a major demographic change, right? So you just have a much larger retiree population relative to the size of the workforce. It's been happening for about 15 years now. It's going to continue for another 15 And so you just have this big bulge of people going into the program. And how do you pay for that? So you probably do need to look at, well, maybe we need to raise the payroll tax somewhat. Maybe we need to raise the premium somewhat to make this more affordable over time. The conditions that were in place when the program was enacted are not the same as they are today. And so you have to make adjustments. Yeah, so it does parallel Social Security in the sense that the pyramid is almost upside down. That is, the payers in by payroll tax are supporting a larger number of people that are collecting. That's right. It used to be more of a pyramid, of course, which smaller numbers at the top and bigger numbers at the bottom. It's still kind of a pyramid, but the base is not quite as big compared to what it was uh, years ago relative to the size of the retirees. And so that that is a shift. And then there's the healthcare component, which is that this is not just a retirement program, but it's also a medical program. And, of course, there's pressures associated with the U.S. running a system that is a little bit more expensive than our peer countries. Right. And so given the fact that it's not politically possible to end the program, I don't think anyone seriously proposes that, it seems like things can be done both on the demand side and the supply side. The supply side, it's kind of like higher education. The costs run away out of control outside of any normal market in any other field of economics that you see. So have you got any ideas on that side? Yeah, there are lots of ideas on the supply side, as you know, and they're big disagreements. So this is not something that easily fits into something where you say, oh, everybody will join in and say, yeah, that's the answer, right? So there'll be ideas that say, look, we need to make this more efficient. How do we make it more efficient over time? There's many provisions that were in the Affordable Care Act from 14 years ago that tried to to pay for care, what they call value-based payment, to try to make the hospitals and physicians work a little more efficiently together to drive down the costs, even as the quality would go up, accountable care organizations and the like. Then there are people who say, well, just cap the prices and cut them even lower, right? Tell the people providing the services, hey, you're going to get paid a little bit less. That, of course, is a tried and true method. And the, the problem there is that they've squeezed that quite a bit already, and it's hard to know if you can get any more out of that. There's always a little bit of room, though, I would say. There's some more ways to squeeze. And then there are folks that are worried about Medicare Advantage, which is the private insurance component of Medicare. And there are big disputes and maybe some evidence that the, the Medicare Advantage plans are getting paid a little bit above what they need to be paid to do the services they're expected to do. And so they're overpaid. And how do you get that money back? And so they aren't overpaid without you know, harming the beneficiaries in the process. So those are some of the things in play. 
None of them easy, though. Uh, that's why this is a big problem. We're speaking with James Capretta. He's senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And then on the demand side, that is the government side that is providing these benefits in concert with people paying in, even into their old age. It kind of comes in from one agency and goes out in the other. What are some reasonable proposals that Congress, if they decided to think about it rationally, could look at? You know, one thing is to redesign the benefit a little bit, not necessarily for the people on the program. So there's a lot of always people say, well, you're changing things and, you know, people are retired. So just to protect everybody on the program, say, no, this would be prospective. But the benefit's a little bit outdated at this point. It doesn't have catastrophic protection. You know, it has this A and this B and this D, all with different deductibles and cost sharing rules. They probably ought to get to a combined benefit that is a little bit more rationally designed with one deductible and one cost sharing structure for all the covered items. And then say to the beneficiaries, hey, you could pick, get it through a government managed process like is the traditional way or through a private plan. And we're going to have them kind of compete with each other. This is an idea that's controversial with some people, but still out there is an idea. It's called premium support. And if you selected a plan that was more expensive than the average, maybe the beneficiary would have to pay a little bit more. And if they selected one that was less expensive than the average, maybe they get to pay a little bit less in a premium. And it's through that kind of a process that you might get people to say, okay, let's find less expensive ways to deliver this so that we can attract more beneficiaries. And so that's the kind of idea that might be out there in the future. It is controversial. I don't want to kid you about that. Sure. Well, all these things are. And what should the financial goal, do you think, of this be for Congress? Because, you know, just currently you've got, you know, major medical care programs, according to the CBO, costing $1.5 trillion, which is more than the discretionary so-called budget, roughly equal to it, way above defense. And then, you know, Social Security is another trillion. And those trends are only going up. What should the financial goal be? I think the financial goal should be permanent solvency for these programs, right? I mean, this is a multi-generational program, right? It's supposed to last across years and decades, be there for workers and retirees and future participants, even those who are just being born this year. So you really should be designing something that has some stability to it and self-corrects so that people always understand it's always going to be there and it's not going to break the bank. So as our demographics change and our cost structures change, build into the program some self-correcting adjustments. So if the premium needs to go up a little bit, it goes up a little bit. Or if the tax rate needs to go up a little bit, it goes up a little bit. Or if you need to adjust what we're paying for services a little bit or deductible, you adjust them a little bit so that the whole thing stays stable and financed and not something that's driving up the federal debt to these astronomical levels that you've been talking about. So I I think that should be the financial goal. And it's doable. I mean, the corrections are large, but it's doable. But you just got to get into it and start making some adjustments. Yeah, for the politicians, it's not so much understanding the finances is what I would call the psychological pieces of it. Fear over, you know, catastrophic loss or worry over affordability of the premiums and so forth as you go into old age, and then the demagoguery of any kind of a change that one side will say to the other, look what you're consigning grandma to falling off a cliff type of discussion. Right. I mean, I think it's pretty nonsensical to assume that the U.S. is going to do something that would be dramatically different from what Medicare already is. So whatever Medicare is in 2040, it's probably going to be recognizable to whatever is being provided today. It's going to be changed, though, to make it somewhat more affordable budgetarily, one way or another. That might mean they just pay the doctors and hospitals even less than they are today with whatever consequences might come from that. But, you know, some adjustments are inevitable, but it will be recognizable as a insurance program for health care for the elderly. And that will be there going forward. Well, we'll never get to the point where, say, you know, spinal fusion costs the same as an oil change. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. Right. And maybe we don't want that to happen. Right. I think you want your, your spine physician to be very highly trained, which means that he or she will probably charge you a little more than that. James Capretta is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, speaking there with Federal Drive host Tom Temin. We'll post this interview along with a link to his Medicare findings at federalnewsnetwork.com slash Federal Drive. Subscribe to the Federal Drive wherever you get your podcasts.